Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think everyone knows who I am, um, but I'm minus my coat tonight because it's hot. Is, is that okay? Okay. Thanks for coming along. For those who don't know me, my name is Chris Yarkonu, and I'm the chairman of the Italian Family History Group. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on traditional Aboriginal land and I acknowledge the Elders past, present and future. And I wish to thank COASIT Board for supporting the work they do and helping us. Tonight we are delighted to have Fabian Moschiano as our guest speaker. Fabian was the foundation member of the Italian Family History Group and has a lot of a long career <coughs> as an archivist working for the Archives Office of New South Wales from 1981 to 2013 when they disbanded it because they had to build a couple of stadiums or something instead. Um, I'd like to call on Fabian now to give his support. Of course, with, with the steady emptying of that office in the rocks of its original records uh, and their movement, movement out to Kingswood, those of us who were still there got less and less dirty. We weren't, um, it wasn't a dirty job anymore like it had, had been originally. Lugging, well, every day you were covered with decaying leather um, and dust of all kinds, so those days changed. And not because the material was being digitised or microfilmed, but simply because the policy was eventually to save government um, the, um, the loss of income that came from having valuable property in the rocks, uh, they, the decision was taken to locate the archives of the state of New South Wales in one place only, and not in a building that had been constructed for it by Premier Rann in 1979. A great pity. But uh, on it goes. I, I suppose... Uh, why did I end up in archives? Well, I did a history degree at UNSW. I didn't want to do librarianship. I didn't imagine myself as a teacher. An archive sounded romantic. But <laughs> archives is a dry administrative profession where the responsibility is to look after the records and facilitate their use by people doing research. If you do any research, it's accidental or it's a pleasure that you um, conceal. <laughs> <laughs> and there was, when I started in 81, a bit of a prejudice against family historians. They were seen as a bit of not serious historians. Um, taking up the time of government officers that could better be used with uh, more academic research. But uh, fortunately that attitude disappeared. And we, we are all very happy to, do, to, to see family historians come up with the answers to the questions they might have come in with when we got the question out of them. Because for some people, the experience of coming into the archives was a bit daunting and they, they talked a fair bit and we had the job to listen. And then we might say, and, and was there a question? Because we couldn't remember everything. But um, I, I don't want to in any way ridicule or downplay family story or little bits of reminiscence. A lady came in once and said, I know it doesn't make sense, but my ancestors came out with Captain Cook. And any, we've all done Australian history, and we know that it's not likely he didn't leave anyone behind. <coughs> he stopped here briefly. And, but we checked various indexes, and we found out the, the lady's ancestress did arrive here in 1878 on the ship Hawkesbury as a government immigrant. That's an immigrant the government imported as a labouring or working per person. And in the hold was the bronze statue of Captain Cook, which now stands in Hyde Park. So you could say, that person could continue to say, I'm descended from someone who came out with Captain Cook, the statue of. Another person insisted there was no need to check the convict indexes because their ancestor was born with a silver spoon in her mouth. 
and so they found nothing until they did find their ancestor in the convict indexes transported for stealing silverware. <laughs> <laughs> so we can be challenged to find the truth of the story. We can be challenged to find a fuller story behind the little reminiscences. And we want to ensure that all of us here and all of us we know, whenever we hear a family story that sounds tall, that um, not to dismiss it, but to research it. And here's an example of someone who did that, Frank Viviano, an American, whose ancestor came from near Palermo, who only heard two little phrases from his grandfather when he was young, and he couldn't understand them. He, one referred to his ancestor as Umonoku, how could my ancestor be a monk? What am I doing here? And another one, Valenti killed him. And that was before his grandfather died. And that's all his grandfather said. But the result of him determining, what does that mean? Where, did, where does his story come from? Is a fantastic book, which I don't think you can fault on the basis of history. But it does show the tremendous amount of perseverance a person would have to put into researching a tall story when, or any story when there's only a few phrases um, that his grandfather uh, mentioned. And the fact that his, um, he was referred to as wearing a red sash. So Frank Viviano goes with those tiny bits of information and the end result is a book, Blood Washes Blood, um, if anyone's uh, and it's also a saying, so I won't give away the secret at the end of the book that blood washes blood means more than revenge uh, blood in the sense of shedding blood. It's a very good story if you see it, this book around by Frank Viviano. So this is just to establish my credentials. <laughs> and because mum always said, you Los Chiavos always like to be centre stage, you're always performing. Not like her side, the Fishers, the Seymours, etc. Not, not at all, they like to be uh, in the back, back benches. So um, I was there and I did win that prize, but I understand there wasn't anybody else in the section. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Friar Lawrence's uh, speech, um, before Romeo comes and interrupts him in the garden as he's picking uh, things uh, and he's talking about the grey-eyed moon smiles on the, the frowning night and there I was dressed in a habit I'd made out of curtains from the sun room and <laughs> that I had to put back and uh, I had a great time. So we're a the theatrical lot, the Los Chiavos. So this will, this will be a clue as to, as to um, stories that you might hear as we go through. Thank you, Terence. Where it started for us, of course, was mum and dad um, meeting in Darwin and falling in love and uh, getting married. Mum, Kat, uh, Helen Frances Mari Fisher, uh, born in Hawthorne in Victoria, and dad born here in, in East Sydney, Yurong Street, and so war meant the, these two people from such different histories came together. Thank you. And uh, um, any, uh, anyone who knows the, the, grand, the great Paino clan may recognise Margarita Paino, who's my godmother. So mum and dad chose people from the Aeolian community as godparents uh, for our baptism. So Granny Seymour. We're going to look at a tall story from Mum's side first. Granny Seymour, uh, born in, um, in Victoria in 1888, uh, Protestant, um, and thank you. Granny was um, not a, uh, a voluble person when we knew her as children. She didn't uh, recount lots of family stories. Oh, heavens, I wish she had it. So she, thank you, Terence. Granny. Very elegant in the fashion of the day, and Grandpa Fisher, Edgar Fisher. So, uh, Auntie, my, my dear aunt, Mum's sister, was a bit of a, a, a good uh, talker about what she recalled from what she'd heard, and um, from Grandpa Fisher's um, 
uh, experience and uh, they met Granny, I think, well referred to as a governess for uh, Carston Waters, a big firm, in, um, a well-to-do family in, in Wallara, and Grandpa, uh, his father was a wheat inspector. Yes. And this is the basis of the, the first tall story. We were always told, as we were lying around on the carpet in the Granny and Grandpa's house at Malabar, they were corsetiers to Queen Victoria. Corsetiers to Queen Victoria. Very impressive. And that's the tall story we'll start with. So, could that possibly be? And it fascinated me looking at these photos, uh, quite apart from the... <laughs> compared to the Los Chiavos there, they don't have uh, <laughs> that wonderful Sicilian mix of beauty, etc. But these were two, uh, 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 now I, I, I understand, uh, spinster Seymour sisters of our great-grandfather. And that's not all we knew, was they were corsetiers to Queen Victoria. So I decided a few years ago, I'd like to get to the bottom of this. I know that it may seem to you that um, being a corsetier to Queen Victoria might not be something you'd want to say or it would elevate your family to a level of, of uh, nobility. But these women, in fact, they did exist, and yes, were their corsetiers. So the first thing I looked at was the, uh, thanks to the digital age, Queen Victoria's uh, servants and staff are all online. So you can get a full list of all the positions occupied, the people, their names and their rate of pay. There's no such person as a corsetier. There's no one who's even mentioned in relation to corsets. So, hmm, where can I go with this? I go to corsets. Now most corsets, it seems, the best quality corsets until up to 1901, when Queen Victoria died, were French. Parisian corsets were top of the range. So, okay, it, doesn't, it looks more likely that Queen Victoria would have used French corsets. But perhaps they needed some adjustments, especially as the years went on. And she had lots of children, of course, and known to be fond of whiskey. And, and Scotsman, <laughs> it's, it's alleged, tall story perhaps, but Mr. Brown, I think we've all seen that film. So, okay, okay, I'm not going to dismiss this story yet. So I'll look at the corsets, and now as you look at corsets, I'll tell you that bit by bit I pieced together that there were two women called Seymour. They were unmarried and remained so till they died. Their occupations in the British census showed them ricocheting between teachers and runners of girls' academies, dressmakers, uh, and listed in the trades lists, they were dressmakers, and corset adjusters, or some, something that, that indicated they had something to do with corsets. So it's, it's getting more factual, and as the census records uh, every 10 years. I can look there now, and on the back of this is written, my two sisters and son, Percy, or Algernon, etc. So I can piece it together that this is a man who was born in South Australia and has gone back to visit his aunties. I think, uh, and, and because I, I can presume, or I'm thinking, the one on the right is older than the one on the left. So that's Anne. And that's Penelope. I think Anne may have a corset on. <laughs> and the style of uh, clothing looks 1880s to 1890s. So I can begin to put a bit of meat around the story and then I'll be able to lay it to rest and follow it through until their deaths. And in due time I'll have a look at the estate papers if I can get them and see what they left in terms of fortune, were they well to do? And all right, they weren't corsetiers, but it's likely now we can say, these, our ancestors made adjustments to the corsets worn by Queen Victoria. So, 
Who cares? <laughs> well, <laughs> this is an example of the kind of thing, it's, it's, it's silly to dismiss the stories. And if you think, all of you, think about are there stories that you've heard, little bits and pieces that don't make sense or sound a bit tall, it's worthwhile looking a bit further. So now we can go on to, to the other side. And this is Giuseppe Loschiavo, Dad's father, born in Santa Marina, in, uh, and Diana's uh, great-grandfather. Uh, this is uh, Giuseppe, my grandfather, who was born in 1873 in Santa Marina, and his parents were Antonino Loschiavo and Giuseppe Giuffre, and that's that is how Diana and I are linked. Uh, now, he came to Sydney in July 1887 as a 12-year-old, but obviously he went back uh, because there was photos of him doing in naval uniform, the usual thing that many of you have, photos of your ancestors if you're Aeolian or Italian, those who served in the, in the naval forces went and did, I think, two years. And we have also his certificate, uh, that shows that he's, he was on a certain ship at a certain date in 1894. So this is Giuseppe, and he comes out here. Another photo, I like this one, it looks a lot like Marco, my older brother, including the hair loss. Some things are hereditary. <laughs> this is Nonna, Dad's mother. Now, Nonna was a different kind of lady because she was able to go to Messina and do the equivalent of a um, high school in an institution which resulted in giving young women the, the, um, the intellectual training for being primary school teachers. And we have her certificate at home showing the mark she got, etc. Now I'm referring to her, she was from Malfa, born in 1877 in Malfa. And some of these stories are probably uh, uh, their origin can be traced to Nonna. Why? And this is where maybe Dr. Destro has good ideas about why people aren't satisfied like the Seymours were with, with true, honest stories of working, of, of being corseteers, etc. Why do they always have to go and recreate themselves as people very special and very high up? What, what is it in in our human experience that means we don't like the, the dull stories or the plainness of being ordinary people. Because a lot of the truth of being ordinary people produces much more interesting stories than if we are making grander claims for ourselves. But I don't know if it was Nonna. I know that we were told by somebody that Nonna was a great boaster about her children in Sydney and all the Los Chiavos, the Los Chiavos, all going to uni, they're all this and they're all that. And of course in 1929, Virgilio was arrested with a group of Sydney Uni students for desecrating the cenotaph. What was the truth? We were never told these stories. Oh yes, and why aren't families able to tell real stories that really show what influence their family life has experienced and suffered? Vidge went down with a group of students on Commem Day and they supposedly rolled a garbage tin lid off in, the, in, in Martin Place. It rolled and dislodged a flower wreath of the cenotaph. The police moved in and arrested two people, a George Templey from Maitland and a Virgilio Oschiavo. And the news uh, paper of the following day was not interested in George Templey. It had alien desecrates cenotaph. <laughs> alien desecrates cenotaph. And referred to his thick accent. And of course, Vidge was rather, they, they, they edited the document, they printed the comments that he made. Oh, the boys will put in and pay for the fine, or whatever. It's only a dummy, he was alleged to have said in reference to the cenotaph. It's only a dummy anyway. <coughs> We didn't know anything of that as growing up. Of course, it's not a story that you're told until I'm uh, on my knees scrubbing the marble floors of Lewisham Hospital and Sister, one of the little company Mary nuns, walked by and said, you're Los Chiavo. Yes. Are you related to the man that desecrated the senator? <laughs> what, Sister? No. Scrub, scrub. 
we go then to Darlinghurst Old Boys reunion, Morris Brothers Darlinghurst. We all wear name tags. Uh, I go with Dad and, uh, to, to, give, to be company for Dad, who was at that school. And um, someone comes up with Los Chiavo. You related to the man who desecrated the Senate, and it happened in 1929. And what happened? What a disgrace. Nonna Concetta, her, her son, in the newspapers. So the Italo Australian, of course, wrote up a totally different uh, report saying, How could you do that? And his father was a war service person, no record of that. But trying to say under no circumstances, and their Fiorezza Fascista, especially Concetta, Fiorezza Fascista, they honour the military uh, achievements of people. But that's what happened. And no record, police record of the depositions have survived, had survived in our archives, but Sydney Uni archives has a copy of the depositions because the Chancellor ordered a copy from the police and filed it. And in that um, deposition, the magistrate says, I'm convinced that the, the defendant had something to do with this issue, and so I found, found, find him guilty and fine him £2.10. So that story just disappears until something happens, you see. And Mum knew about it, and when I rang up that night after coming home from work, she said, oh, he was, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. <laughs> anyway, he did do it, but what did he do? Probably just a student prank. And he was too proud, apparently, to apologise to the Chancellor, so that's why he was stood down, as, we, as it was reported. However, he did go back and he uh, finished his degree, and when he, like, because he was two years later, he graduated with his sister Lydia, and in the Great Hall, when their names were read out to receive their degrees, there was total silence. <laughs> Not a person clapped. <laughs> People don't forget. So these are the sorts of stories. So we can get to the bottom of it and um, we can see our uh, poor Nonna must have had to do some... Mm. Well, I think she just felt that he couldn't have done such a thing. Her son could not have done such a thing. Uh, probably just an accident. But uh, the papers were very keen to take note of his Italianness. So there, that's an example. So Nonna probably shortly after she arrived, so they married in 1901, and she didn't want to emigrate, but she finally did with the three-year-old Virgilio in 1912. So we were told by Dad, we are counts, and the title passes through the male line, and that makes Marco a Viscount. <laughs> and we are the Counts di Radicini, Los Chiavo, nobility. So we all grew up, of course, believing that. Why wouldn't we? It struck me, though, even as a teenager, how sad that Nono, a count, had to, to make a living flogging bananas in Park Street. <laughs> Why? What? But he never lost sight of his nobility because he hangs a coat of arm, copy of the coat of arms above the fruit. This is in his King Street shop in 1930. So you can see the, the coat of arms above the fruit. It's a bit faint, but you can see just above his head, under the lamp. Yes. And it's got a coronet, that's a count's coronet. And it has the motto, Perseveranza. Which could more loosely be described in the Los Giavo experience of pig-headedness. <laughs> We're not going to give up. But we have to let go of this. Here he is in better days, about 1910, in Park Street. Park Street fruit shop. It's very grand, isn't it? And on the back of this photo, as many of those photos were turned into postcards, it's addressed to Nonna. So I think he's sending it back saying, come on, come out, look at this, look what you get if you come out. Look at this lovely shop, look at your handsome husband. Bring out that boy Virgilio. And, of course, Vig did make up the sit for his activity at Sydney Uni by painting the, the famous mural in the refectory there, the Epic of Man, which is still there. And he won the Sulman Prize in 1946, 46 or 47, so he did okay. 
And at that shop, there's still a, a coffee shop there, number 60, but of course all the buildings are gone. So there he's addressed it to um, Concetta Boschiaro Bongiorno, her name was Bongiorno, Insegnanti. So she's a teacher at Malfa, and she didn't want to emigrate. So we never knew her, uh, Francesca and I. Marco had his first five years of life with Nonna. He died in 1949. So he speaks Italian very well. And uh, we all, the girls all have, have parts of Nonna's names and Nonna's sister, Vittoria. So it's their real mix, like some of you too. Irish and Sicilian uh, make a good mix, I think. But it's nice to have the English Scots and Scots there too. You can see the Seymours have some really good, good features, good thick eyebrows. Uh, the men, though, are thinning hair, like the Lospiavo <laughs> side. The women get all the good features. So, this came by accident. So, I thought, I have to find this out. And in the Blazoni, the books published of coats of arms of Sicilian families, there is something Eschiavo, Schiavone, um, and there's something Bongiorno, there's Giuffre, there's all sorts of coats of arms in that lovely reproduction book of Blasoni. So, but, this uh, discovery, or this bit of story, we had to let go of. Why? Because it's very clear what's on that form. This is given page and fo folio and volume number of the, the Book of Nobility. It's a title awarded in 1865, not 1665, 1865, by the Piedmontese to Pasquale Loschiaro, and there's a big lot of Loschiaros in Taria Nova, or Radicini as it was known. It, there's lots including uh, well, well, well to do people, and there is a noble family of Loschiaro, but they're nothing to do with us. If you trace your line back directly and you look at people's siblings, you can get back on Selina, say it's the late 18th century, but fairly confidently. So Giuseppe, Antonino, born in 1839, his father Giuseppe, born in 1798, all agricultural workers. And probably the top level of what, what they would have become were landowners on the island of Selina, which implied possibly they didn't dig the earth eventually with their own hands, other people did the work, but it didn't make them nobility. And as far as we can see, <coughs> there is no noble family that has a long residence in Santa Marina, perhaps the Giuffres or the La Cava, but in fact, it's a family of, of working people who acquire property, land, and in, from 1880, of course, as we know from the loss of the Malvasia uh, uh, wine, our ancestors, those of us who are Aeolians, only a small percentage of the audience tonight, <laughs> probably, could say, um, uh, we comfortably off houses with, or, or are they comfortably off because their immigrant children began sending money back to buy iron beds, English bone china, and, uh, and clothes that or perhaps a corset or two. So there's no basis to this. And that happened, Jeff Loschiavo, or Losch, Jeff Losch, whose father was Norman Losch, Loschiavo, but he explained to me that Dad changed their name, Norman changed their name during the war, from Loschiavo to Losch making him sound very German. L-O-S-C-H, Losch, von Losch. So they and their family had this coat of arms. And when he brought it to an Italian family history group, oh, you've got a coat, are you counts too? Yes, yes, we're counts. What are you, what are you descended? Oh, we're descended from someone in Santa Marina. But if you read it, <coughs> it's awarded only to Pasquale Loschiavo in 1865. And it's to be passed through the male line. So we know if, if you do your research, you can establish pretty much what your ancestors are doing. So Giuseppe was born in 1877, <coughs> 1874, Antonino in 1839. In that one generation, 
How is it possible they became wealthy enough? Where is the evidence? There is no evidence. So when you, when you ask Antonio Loschiaro on the island, why is it that all these Loschiaros have these coats of arms and say they're counts? Is it proud? Someone called Loschiaro has been made a count. I'm proud of that, says Giuseppe. I'll get a copy. I'll write off and I'm going to get a copy. And the copies are on vellum. They would have been expensive. And I'm going to get a painted job of it too and I'm going to put it above my food shop. And is it that coming to this country, aliens were made to feel, perhaps because they were of Italian origin, somehow not uh, as, as grand as their peer group who were English, Irish or whatever? I'm not sure. You would know, I mean, my ex experience of prejudice that was very minimal at Morris Brothers East with just teachers saying in this class role, when are you going to get a real name? <laughs> <laughs> because they didn't want to say Los Chiaro. So it was that the case? Is it that in a new land, anything that gave you a sense of, we, we don't come from a country where we're digging potatoes. We come from a country with thousands of years of history, cultural history, language, music, and our own identity. So, that's, that's the end of that story. But um, it doesn't mean, it means that now I can go to Tarianova one day and say I'm a Los Chiaro too, or, well, when did you go across to the islands? When did the Los Chiavos go over from Calabria to the islands? And it's likely they went over earlier than the late 18th century, and that they, they saw opportunities for making a living there. And the remaining Los Chiavos in Tarinova did well, well enough to, to acquire a title, because there is a noble Los Chiavo. So, it's I suppose like, well, my name's Smith, I'll look up the Smith coat of arms, I'll get a copy, I like that, and that's fair enough. But we all want to know, it's, all, it's, it's a decision we have to make to get to the bottom of the story. Tonight, Francesca's driving me over in a very small little car called um, Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> Awful, I call it the Hobbit car. You had to crawl into it, but you're driving her. And she's reminiscing that Dad made adjustments to Joan Sutherland's dentures. <laughs> and Joan Sutherland's here tonight Joan. <laughs> Joan has met numbers of people called Joan Sutherland and they have a little club, don't they? Joan Sutherland. I like <laughs> But how could I research that story if I wanted to? Well, I don't know what happened to Dan's dental records. Um, perhaps Joan Sutherland's records might record that she went to Dr. Loscaro and had an adjustment to the dentures. Dad fixed very well, because when she went into the high notes, Francesca says, they rattled it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sea of family history and stories. This, I, I have to apologise, I don't remember who gave me the copy of the photo, but it was someone in the Italian family history group. It's probably about 1913 or 1914, and all the members of the Aeolian, Isola Aeolia Circolo, have their sashes on, and one is Nono, holding little Vidge, who just arrived with his mother. Every one of those people and branches of Aeolian families would have wonderful stories. And I hope that they're being extracted, written down and recorded. What a sea of, of fascinating faces and how many stories reside in all of those people. Thank you. And they look pretty well to do, well, well dressed and confident. Nono at the end of his life, and the story uh, we grew up with was he had a nervous breakdown in 1932, returned to Rome, and when the war broke out, he was sent back to Salina, and he died there in 1944. But in the letter that Vidge writes to his sister, he explains what happened. That in the letter, and it's a letter, not a historical document, that Nonna blew a thousand pounds, 
showing off to her friends in Messina, and Nono, in a white rage, went to a woman in William Street. And the end result of that was uh, uh, syphilis. <laughs> syphilis! <laughs> so he goes back in 1932, and in Nonna's estate papers from 1944, where she's trying to minimise the taxable estate of the late Giuseppe Loschiavo, she puts a fee of £200 that had been paid towards the Bella Squadra Hospital in Rome. And I thought, if I can find the medical records, I'll see what did he suffer from. Was it true what Vidge said? Um, and I'm asking everyone, archivists in Rome, the Bella Squadra, oh, no, no, that's an infant's hospital. Oh, there's one in Florence that's a military hospital. Finally, last year, I just put Bella Squadra into Google. This is, this is a very lazy way of research. And up comes a mention on eBay for sale, the prospectus of the Bella Squadra Private Hospital in Rome. Beautiful prospectus from 1929, photos of the patients' rooms, the electric shock uh, um, uh, equipment in the laboratory, the billiard room with some of the patients, and Dr. Maserotti in his white coat. Now, someone's published a book on Dr. Maserotti's work. He was the foremost treat, uh, me medical professional looking at venereal disease and homosexuality and uh, opportunities for curing those diseases, as they were considered at the time. And it shows the grounds, the badminton court, the beautiful view over Rome. I would imagine it would be quite pricey, but Nonna kept the fruit shop going and paid those medical fees. Something happened in 1939 that stopped the money going through, so he was sent back to the island. And I only get anecdotal experience that he was singing arias and punching the air and calling for his wife and children, which may have been signs of third degree, third stage syphilis. So he dies in 1944. This man that came and worked so hard his fruit shops rivaled the Delucas. That's how good he was. Who, who consolidated his ownership of the property in Santa Marina by buying his brothers and sisters' shares out. So that beautiful house and the Macazzino were entirely the property of Giuseppe. In his decline, reclining years, he could sit on the, the terrace of the Macazzino and sing arias. It was his house. He, he had extraordinary commitment to work and family. Uh, the buying of the flats in Double Bay, their loss because of the depression, etc., etc., comes to the wheel of illness and then finally death in Santa Marina. And the final, his final day is not, um, is, is not a legend because for evidence to prove to the um, department of, the probate department in New South Wales that he's dead, because Nonna can't get a death certificate in 1944, his sister, Nunziata, writes a letter. And this letter is filed with all the dry papers of what the furniture's worth in Victoria Street, how much is the house in Yerong Street worth. Here is this torn letter pinned to the file, and it's written in dialect. It goes from bits of Italian into dialect, and it's saying, Peppino uh, got uh, uh, a little bit um, hungry. He asked for more milk and bread. He seems to have forgotten that there was a war on. And then he died. I dressed him in, his, in a good white shirt, this is Nunziata, and uh, please tell us, as soon as possible, where you want him put. And that's the last we hear of him. We don't know where he's buried because the cemetery doesn't have a list of who's buried where, just a list of who's buried. It's possible they put him in the Fossa Comune. So this man who created this crazy Loschiaro family, of which we are now, my sister's daughter, is ready to give birth to another child, but her husband is um, half British, half Chinese, 
<laughs> so, like all of your experience, we're getting to be thoroughly multicultural. It started back with Giuseppe. So, that, that, um, that's the kind of thing where the truth hurts. But for me, as an archivist, I'd like to see a medical register. I'd like to see documents. So what's left to me is to see if Maserati's document records include his medical files. They quite likely don't because people don't value them when you finish your practice. Presumably a lot of doctors are not required to keep files past 15 years in New South Wales unless it's a... And so you're lumbered as a professional doctor or psychiatrist with probably a lot of patient files that are very sensitive. What can you do with them? Uh, how can you protect the privacy of people in those files? And yet they, they have answers for people. Uh, so that's the end of Giuseppe. I think the source of some of the tall stories was Nonna, and I think a very, very receptive ear was Dario. Dad was very, very proud of being Italian, uh, of being a, an heir to the, the Roman Empire, and he liked to rub it in. I think Dario was a very receptive ear, and Vidge, not being an artist, not necessarily a historian, may have also repeated the same things. So they come down, and in, in two generations, we become much better than the rest of the community. And in Marsfield, we didn't mix with the Calabrians. I don't know why we were in the Children of Mary, perhaps my sisters met them, but they went to Mass, and there was the Madonna della Grazia. We didn't go, no, we were different. We were counts. So, <laughs> snobbery, perhaps, or who knows what. And you grow up with this, and I'm glad we've researched it. It's no shame in it uh, that we're not counts, but we're the descendants of, of a hard-working Southern Arnold, and, and the sadness in their lives uh, we have to be aware of and accept and document what we can. So, Dad went to his grave, probably fortunately, without me, the irritating, snoopy, questioning person being able to say, Poppy, not true. <laughs> I know he'd be very angry. Yes, it is. And then he would give me uh, a reference point that would give further evidence to whatever he said. Um, Unfortunately, Simon, my dear late brother, had told all his co-workers in the Eden area where he was a ranger for 21 years in uh, Nadji, or Schiavo, so Irwick House. <laughs> I get to be the Viscount when Marco dies. It's my brother that spoke with this very, very down-to-earth low-key, very low-key Irwick House. So <laughs> when Si heard me talking about this, I could see he was disappointed and he looked, gave me a look as if to say, just shut up. Yeah. Why can't you leave a good story alone? He, not only in his naval uniform, which sent me off to the naval archives in Rome to find that the ship he served on, which Dad said, oh, he fought at Caporetto, they bombarded the ship, was an old barge, the former Derby from 1867, that the Austrians had lobbed a bomb at in the Italian-Austrian War in the 1860s. It, it was a training vessel for young military conscripts. But I had a good day there. I had a good day and I met uh, an, a, a researcher, a retired admiral, and he found a picture of the ship for me. And um, if I wanted a service record, I'd have to go to La Spezia. But it would just say what's on the certificate. He got 9.5 9 for his bombing skills as a cannoniere. He did well with his test. Good. Back to the Seymours. This handsome man, William Thomas Seymour, uh, Granny's, one of Granny's four brothers, and the four brothers all enlisted in the First World War. Two of them were killed at Villas Bretonneux. They were farm boys from, West, from Western Victoria. Um, William Thomas, mum was, um, Mum enlisted in the army nursing service. She was very proud of, of uh, serving in the war and wanted to go and visit Uncle Will in her uniform as she returned from Darwin in 1945. And her aunt said, no, Helen, 
he's not well, you know, best not to. And she was deeply disappointed. Not well, well, he was an alcoholic. And Granny was a temperance, his sister, my grandmother, was a strict temperance person in the um, Rechabite Lodge. And Grandpa was a Lodge member too. Uh, Rechabites are temperance masons, no alcohol. So Uncle Will would come and visit, and Mum had very warm <coughs> memories of Uncle Will. And uh, we grew up with the story, Uncle Will, uh, uh, on the French uh, front, a telegram comes back to Granny, Granny, uh, our Granny's mother, saying, your son is missing in service, dead. William Thomas, sorry, Tom, uh, William Thomas Seymour. Um, and on the basis of the reception of that telegram, his fiancée marries her best friend. Uncle Will is demobbed and comes back and finds the woman he's loved has married someone else. And he becomes an alcoholic for the rest of his life. No. The dossier, all the dossiers for First World War servicemen and women are now being digitised and scanned. And I got them for Mum, for the four that served, and for Granny's father. But he was considered, a very awful comment, a useless old man. <laughs> he tried to enlist as well. So, Will's file has, in the list, of, a very methodical list, there's nothing in that file that indicates a confusion of telegrams because the telegram sent to her named Will as being killed. In fact, it was James Allen, the younger brother, was killed. There's nothing in any of the files about a confusion of telegrams. No indication of it being informed the wrong, oh, we've just informed the mother of one of the four service people of the, of the death of the wrong one, we must fix it up. No, but in Will's file, all the different uh, annotations, venereal disease. So I showed it to Mum, and very compassionate person, our mother, and she said, oh well, all young men, a long way from home, lonely, in France, so he gets some form of venereal disease. Would it not make sense then that he comes back to Melbourne and he doesn't feel he can marry his fiancée because he has venereal disease. And the story of the telegrams, it's a way of explaining the alcoholism, the sadness, depression, possibly. And very hard to get to that, the truth of the story because the story comes from his mother and his sisters, our grandmother, would have told mum and her other, her other daughter, Kat, this story. And, and Mum's fondness for Uncle Will was such that she was deeply disappointed she couldn't go and say, see, I'm in the army too. So the file there is very clear that he has uh, venereal disease um, in France. Possibly that's an explanation. Thank you. That's Will on discharge. A little, a quick little one, very faded photo, but on the back, thank you Terence, I think it shows the inscription on the back of the photo, there's no place like home, or something like that. And it's stamped Tonawanda, New York. And we knew that our ancestor, Fisher ancestor, had married twice, and now we know bigamously, in New South Wales, and we're descended from that second marriage. And I met the relatives and they told me the truth of what had happened, that he disappeared and brought two of his sons to Australia and married and declared himself to be a widower. So this photo, though, was not an American photo. If we go back, Terence, it's in Underwood Street, Paddington. And I never took any notice of it. And there is my grandfather in 1890, the baby, being held by Francis Maria Hobbs, and next to her, William Fisher and his brother. And it, 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 well, when I looked at it, I thought, what is that terrace next door? And in the photo, it shows a Victorian terrace. There it is today. 
the, the last cottage there and the bit of terrace next to it. So look closely at photos, don't always accept what's written on the back. Probably it was sent back to his relatives because in spite of all the double marriage, they seem to have quite an amicable relationship over all the generations. So, Nonna, uh, Nonna had a sister who was killed in the earthquake in 1908. And some of you might have come to that 100th anniversary we had at the archives. And the story, of course, there, she had nightmares. Her sister was calling her, Conchetta, come and take the, the stones from me. Conchetta goes to Messina and find, in that pile of rubble with 85,000 bodies, she digs in the rubble and finds her sister's body and it's brought back to, to Malfa to be buried. Is that real? Well, we went into the cemetery at Malfa and that photo is on a grave and there's a poem written. But whether there's a body in it, I don't know. Who is Mr. Henry Fisher? That's my next challenge, to find the oldest photo in the photos we have is Mr. Henry Fisher. Who's Mr. Henry Fisher? Who cares? I'd like to find out. Could be an ancestor. And as, as his age is 93 and 1868, um, might be quite interesting to, to find out. Finally, coats of arms. Italian coat, the use of coats of arms is not a, a regimented matter. And after 1946, when the, Italy became a republic, the heraldic college was abolished with the uh, monarchy. So the use of coat of arms was already um, pretty loose in Sicily. So don't worry if you've got a nice coat of arms, you can have to take your pick. <laughs> but if you're trying to say, it's the coat of arms of the count of my name, do the research. Uh, that's the book, and that's about it, I think. That's it. Thank you very much, Terence. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd like to thank um, our sponsors and thank you once again for coming. And under somebody's seat is a note that says yes. Here we are. Thanks very much. Chris. Congratulations. Thank you. Hooray. Ralph and his wife Connie, who have come all the way from um, Rouse Hill <laughs> and come constantly. Fabian, um, my cousin Robert Yakuno, came home once from Italy with a coat of arms and they showed it to me. He said, this is the Yakuno coat of arms. Very impressive. I said, where'd you get that? He said, I went to Palermo and there was a lady there that had a shop and you give her 10 bucks and she goes around the back, she comes back with your coat of arms and says, there you are. Now our coat of arms says, we come from Spanish nobility. So there you are. So anyone who'd like to match Fabian's coat of arms, just go to Palermo, 10 bucks, get you one even as good as if not better. I'd like to also thank tonight is my daughter Nadia, and as you all know, I'm trying to get young people here, not that we're old, but I'm trying to get young people here that will carry on this, this organisation when one day we're not here. So at least we've got a young person here today. Fabian, we know that Virgil had a cloud over him, and we know Lydia had fascist leavings. How did your father avoid being interned? Did he beat them by joining up? I think that's what happened. That he, he enlisted in Victoria where he wasn't known. But in that way, he, he avoided it. Because in the file, it's state, uh, in the National Archives file, he and Ridge are listed as suitable candidates for internment because they were, they were actively recruiting for the Doppelavoro. And someone complained, how come my husband's interned and the Los Giavos aren't. So Lydia, I mean, Vidge goes to India for the war and paints. Uh, Dario goes to Victoria and enlists in the army. And the story is he punched out a corporal because the corporal said, what are Dagos like you doing in the army? Well, I'd have to, there's nothing on his service file. There is a demotion, but there's no crime recorded.
I don't know how many discovers there are in Sydney, but my daughter was a student at St Vincent's College, and in 1980, oh, sorry, in 2005, when she finished school, she was awarded the Lascalvo Scholarship, which was um, in honour of a young woman who had become a teacher and died quite early in life. And I'm just wondering if that's any relation of yours, or if that's a story that we could look up. She's a government teacher. The list are there. If she's a private school teacher, we'd look at the yeah. archives of the school. She must have been a student, yes, at St Vincent's and College. A, and a student, yes. The student roles would be held by the Sisters of Charity for St Vincent's, and it's uh, something you can research. St Vincent's Convent gave her weight, so I think the connection would be definitely there with that convent. Yes. Thank you. There are lots of lost Chiavas and it's an awfully, awfully humbling experience. Maybe all of you have had that to go to Santa Marina or Selena and see that the, the, your name is not so uncommon. <laughs> Thanks for a really honest and compassionate treatment of your ancestors. There should be much more of it. You, 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 you're indulgent towards people's weaknesses. And that's what we should be. I think we're beautiful. I really, really thank you. Thank you. Just in relation to people um, trying to find out some of their um, ancestors and their nonni and their nonni nonni, um, I had someone contact us on the page and they said that they can't get any more records from the town hall. How do they go about going through, uh, I think you mentioned before, the church? The church is the records of what's the best way for them to do that? Okay, you go to the Mormon website, you look on, not the search facility under names, but you look under catalogue. In the catalogue, you put the Komune name, and it will come up if it's been microfilmed. We're over time, and we can't carry on for much longer, but I do want to say one thing which is very important. Fabian has agreed to join our committee. It's been fantastic. The rest of it is what um, we've been here doing in the first place, and that is ancestry. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.